which is a kind of a catharsis. And that's why I called you because I, I, I realized if I could get to the point of just making this about the friends that I've made doing it, mm -hmm. you know, and people make a kind of a, a positive community around it, right. you know, which is the goal, which is a goal, then that would be enough, you know, I don't, and then, you know, slip in the information, slip in promoting people's, you know, art and their artful work and all. That's great as well. Uh, well, I'm also a proponent of the community uh, idea. I often speak of Glass Eye Picks, my company, with uh, that terminology because I do believe, you know, we are citizens. We're here to support each other. It's a very mean, troubling world, fairly arbitrary. Mm -hmm. You could argue that it's meaningless, and, you know, we create our own realities. And if you celebrate community and you support each other, um, both literally making art and and in a maybe a, a a bigger community way. I think that's a very valuable ethos, especially now where we really see depravity all over in our national conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I just feel that uh, the baseness of human nature has been weaponized, a popular mm -hmm. term, but mm -hmm. I it um, applies. It feels like. Uh, the a century of capitalism Oops, sorry. and uh, branding mm -hmm. has led us to this um, really desperate time mm -hmm. where there's a crassness and a coarseness to our discourse and to uh, our technologies. Our communication technologies have really shaped um, the way we interact, and it's very vindictive. Uh, it's very brief, it's unnuanced, and it's corrosive and toxic. And I used to complain about the, you know, the oil and gas industries, which there's plenty to complain about, but I think the new downfall of humanity are these technologies, um, you know, Facebook you, and so on. Yeah, right. I mean, even just the phone, which, you know, yeah, the a phone, lot of people... It is an addiction. I'm an addictive personality. I yeah. didn't hook into the phone at an early age, so it's something I can put away. I can literally put it away for the weekend. You, you can? Know? Oh, yeah. I, I don't care about the phone. And I also don't do Instagram and the, some of those things that... But I I've, I will look up uh, news items every 20 minutes just mm -hmm. as sort of an idle, oh, I have a moment, let's see what's going on. And you realize and I'm my clicking is creating the, the demand for a new news story every half hour, which yeah. is... Uh, just of course it's just a habit because i wouldn't really want to encourage that i noticed the um, it was a little i guess off topic but i noticed when my father who's an older guy now and he every uh, he watches local news something that i've kind of gotten out of the habit of doing because i don't have cable you know i don't right. i don't really do that i watch stuff through other kinds of platforms is but i noticed when he's watching it the the news is terrifying <laughs> first of all right. and they're also just every day the weather has to be i can't complain about this before but i you know they they have to kind of broadcast the weather like it, always as a, it has to be news breaking right yeah. so they have to sh shape the story that, uh, somehow in order to make people anxious you know to create anxiety around it it's just another thing that i uh, i totally noticed. concur yeah. i mean one thing that was fascinating in the 60s marshall McLuhan, you know the mm -hmm. media is the message mm -hmm. message uh, a lot of this thinking that did come out was very vital and really talked about the thing about um television news is that you have to see something that can progress that can be filmed so a fire is going to get more coverage because that you, there's a beginning and an end you know there's the the third story there's the baby dropping out of the window and so mm -hmm. that's exciting and so that's what they would put on the news you don't put on the story of p people planting trees or something that's a lower mm -hmm. impact uh, visual so all of these things and now of course in our social media these things shape the way we uh even communicate and i agree with you everything has to be news breaking uh yeah. absolute disaster and there's a sense of hysteria and it's and this is really the problem you know everybody loves to say there's fox news or there's msnbc and cnn's in the middle but the point is is they are all trying to create a sense of urgency so you'll tune in mm -hmm. so this is what i mean by branding has destroyed us you're either a fox news watcher or msnbc you mm -hmm. You and this is how people identify themselves, and this happened 
in the 70s and 80s, you started seeing people wearing T-shirts with uh, Those corporate logos. logos. Yeah. That was not how you behaved in the 70s. No. That would yeah. have been absurd. Why would I advertise something like a Coca-Cola or a Nike? Yeah. So it's been a very careful. But that's why, you know, it really does come back to capitalism. When you monetize everything, when you try to destroy the post office so that you can then use UPS or um, FedEx you are destroying the mechanisms by which we have a common civil obligation to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, well, one of many things that's, that's going wrong, and it's rarely in the conversation because we're looking at the fires. Well, I think you make a very good point about the post office, a wholly owned subsidiary of Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, it's good to, uh, it's good to have friends. <laughs> It's good to have friends, and it's uh, it's good to have projects that you know that you can at least work on. Or do you feel like you're uh, effective in in creating what you create is having an impact? Do you feel like in your own way? Uh, only in my own way, which yeah. is to say, in a very small, humble way. Um, it's I always say that uh, showbiz is a hierarchy. You know, I am certainly the. Mm -hmm the proud leader of a little company that creates very small independent films, um, often horror movies, but I support artists of other stripes. And, you know, I've made a difference in a couple people's lives as a result, but it's hard to really claim to have made, you know, an impact on the uh, real world of showbiz. Um, but you have to do what you can, and that would be obviously a message for anybody as they get older to stop resenting um, their failings and, you know, to embrace the life you have. So, you know, all of this sort of being wrapped up together. Um, but Glass Eye Picks is a lovely little institution, emphasis on little. Uh, but we have made uh, some great independent movies, and I think we've helped first-time filmmakers um, start their careers and we've been a support system for some filmmakers mm -hmm. who continue and then of course we make radio plays and comic books so mm -hmm. there's a lot of artists who have passed through that that little uh institution and i i consider them the community and you know a lot of them yeah. speak fondly of having uh worked um together mm -hmm. really you know we had the golden period was like Ty West and Graham Resnick and Peter Polk and Brent Kunkel, these guys worked with me in the uh, 2000s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but now we have uh, Jen Wexler has been fantastic as a producer and she has her own movie out now and it's really fun to see her enjoy the, the just the excitement of doing interviews and you know trying to shape a narrative around her movie that makes it a bigger movie than um, than maybe the actual experience but really sharing the types of envelopes she was trying to push, and then it does become a valuable conversation. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, is that? Jen Wexler, you said? Is Jen Wexler. She What's made a film? movie called The Ranger. Mm -hmm. We shot uh, over a year ago now, and she's been doing the festival circuit. I'm very pleased to say we'll be opening at IFC uh, August 17th for a week long run. Uh, and then we open in LA in September, and we have. Um, a really fun tour of East Coast uh, drive-in theaters. So, what uh, the uh, uh, how many are there? As far as you know, I'm not actually sure. Okay, uh, oh. three to seven. <laughs> that, that's that's pretty uh, impressive. That that I mean, I'm sure once there were like fifty, sixty. Oh, no doubt. Maybe yeah. even far more than that. I don't know. Well, there's a big country, maybe, but these are the ones that will accept. That's, okay, that's true. I'm sure there are yeah. still uh, as novelties go you know yeah there are still well the drive can't be is still a great experience i mean obviously it's not as integrated into our normal lifestyle but uh, they're upstate drive-ins and you can see first run movies and in fact it's probably more unusual to see an indie film but we really want to um put it up on those screens and just have it be a good time this is a movie about uh, punk rockers who get was it contemporary um, story Yes, although okay. it's sort of in a mellif mellifluous uh, mm -hmm. 80s setting. Vague. Uh, okay. Vague. Mm -hmm. I think it, Jen calls it 80s dreamland, mm -hmm. which is to say it's not specific, but you can feel um, the influence of 80s horror and of punk. And these guys um, 
have an altercation with the law, and then they head to the country uh, to uh, escape, and they meet a deranged uh, park ranger. So it's a fun sort of uh, (laughs) Uh affront to authority, um, almost in a a kind of throwback way. Um, But uh, there's other dimensions and nuances to it that come from Jen's own orientation Mm -hmm. and uh, the things that interest her and the main character played by Chloe Levine. Uh, is really uh, very compelling. So it's a fun, it's a very fun movie, but it has uh, some unexpected uh, perspective. So that's oh. I'm very uh, happy to put that. What, out. What, 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 during a project like that, you're on the set. What's your what's your role? I mean, what, what, how much are you're producing it, or right? Is that your title, producer on this? I'm a. I consider myself a creative producer. This uh-huh. movie was made along with Andrew Vanden Houten, who's a very uh, dynamic. Uh, very active independent film producer Mm -hmm. Um, and he and I have known each other for quite a while I've acted in movies of his but we've never partnered up in a producing way Mm -hmm. Uh, he's really great with numbers nuts and bolts but we filmed in my hometown here in uh, the east coast Um, Jen was also a producer because she sort of knows the nuts and bolts so it was a nice um, Uh, you shot up 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 in um... we shot upstate where I've yeah. made, yeah, most of your at films. least a dozen movies, uh-huh. and uh, but my role is to be encouraging to really talk through the sort of the nuts and bolts of filmmaking, and you know, but, is your story getting conveyed? Do you have the stuff you need? Uh, have you considered doing it this way since we can't afford that way? Right, uh, and then I get involved. Solutions and yeah, and ideas and yeah. um, and feedback. a general attitude yeah. of if you will, punk rock. Uh, you know, we make punk movies, uh, which is what we've yeah. been saying recently to tie it into the Ranger. But, you know, we've always had that aesthetic of do something bold, do something different. Um, can't take no for an answer. If you don't have enough money, then you just have to do it a different way. But never let up on the story that you wanted to tell. This is where I digress from certain other, you know, independent-minded filmmakers where they want to... Um, Make sure it all happens in one house and it's present day. You know, they they design the script for the money. And I say, no, let's make a spaceship movie and let's figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. We don't have any more money and it's going to be kooky, but we might come up with something. Mm -hmm. And we've done that. We made a movie called Automatons in black and white Super 8. And uh, we had robots created... uh, with you know garbage cans and tin foil mm-hmm. and it's a very striking movie it's by james mckinney that's just one example yeah i understand uh, but and i and i understand depending on your relationship with the director uh your role is a little different each time perhaps yes you know obviously that makes sense and you might have more to do with the screenplay and the developing of the screenplay mm-hmm. into it or script into a screenplay i guess yeah and in another sh- film, you might be more just hands-on on the, during the, the actual production. It's really Depends. important that you listen to yeah. the director and you really try to figure out and um, enhance what they are saying. And then you kind of... We made a movie called Like Me with uh, by yeah. L- Rob Mockler. Um, and that was a very good experience. It was his first feature. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he came at it from one perspective and he wanted a really bold look and we found the right cinematographer for him who incidentally went on to do the ranger and in fact my film uh depraved so uh it's about uh hooking people together and as i have sort of expressed having this aesthetic of everyone's in it together to win it and so that you create uh a team of like-minded people who really want it to be special mm-hmm and, you know, I do believe in the old Coppola cliche. He always said, this is uh, the last place for a dictator to exist. In that regard, the director is first. It's not the producer. I mean, the producer is important, and Glass Eye has sort of a, a vibe to their movies. But the whole agenda is to make unique films, unique to the artist in question, the, the director. Um, and that's our uh, agenda. Uh, have you? But you've worked, as you already said, a number of times with first-time filmmakers, and then you're on the set there, and maybe you're like the papa. You know, you're yeah. You've developed into that. 
some some may be uh, not so confident or you know maybe doubting themselves a little bit rarely doubting themselves i mean usually okay. by the time we're going to make a movie and we've somehow found the they're, money they're and ready all to that, go yeah they're, they're ready excited. to go what uh-huh. they may be is deluded or uh, <laughs> yeah. or panicky right. and then you come in and you say listen Let's let's talk this through. What is the intention of the scene? I mean, I do feel like a, a mentor or even a teacher figure in in some regard. But mm-hmm. usually, these are people who really, really passionately care about movies, and they have a lot of ideas. And if anything, it's just a matter of saying, "Well, we'll never be able to do that." And we mm-hmm. know we love Kubrick, but this is not going to happen. And then every now and again, though I rarely take this position, you do say you might want to be safe and get this other angle so you will have cut ability even though we know it's all going to be a wonder you know <laughs> uh, right. those not kind trying of to send you mixed signals here. yeah exactly but um, but coverage you know, so so right. those things and yeah. then just uh obviously casting uh finding the right art department um figuring out how to allocate money and then quite literally when we shoot upstate just knowing how those resources can play out using old favors to uh I mean, that's one of the hard things is that, you know, 20 years later, it's still a lot of this is based on favors. And, you know, I always say to my collaborators, I just wish I was bringing you the big money making projects so we could all relax and not rush through the mix or rush through the color correct. But honestly, it's the economics of independent movies have really gotten worse, not better over the period that I've been working. Mm-hmm. So I can't say too many good things about any of that. Mm-hmm. And when people do graduate from the glass eye model and try to make TV or do bigger projects, I always bless them, and I know that's what they need to do because you, it's not sustainable. It's it's pretty brutal, which is why we do even other things like make sure. radio plays. <laughs> well, that's what we all do. <laughs> right. It's the perfect solution to not being able to make movies is to make something <laughs> else. Make something else that's even more commercial. That's even more complicated. <laughs> Uh, that's coming up too, though, right? You have another um, record, uh, live recording that's coming up yeah. at the Walter Reed. So we have a project called Tales from Beyond the Pale, which I've done with Glenn McQuaid, who's a filmmaker, uh, for, I don't know, I'm very bad with time, but uh, 2008 maybe or nine we started. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do a half-hour genre-based audio plays with full sound effects and if they're live with full foley on stage foley is the guy that makes the noise or stabs the pumpkins for that sound effect and uh pumpkin would be a human uh, that would be a human human being yes human flesh um so these have been a great catharsis that helps one write you have to come up with a 40 page script uh often with the gun to your head uh, we've involved many, many other writers and directors. Some uh, of whom appeared on, on the earlier episode of this show. Indeed, we did, indeed. Uh, I think the last, the last appearance, or one of the last appearances. Yeah, so uh, they're just a really fun, quite unique art form. Mm-hmm. The art of listening and of conveying stories um, without literal dialogue. We... Uh, but but every script is different. Sometimes there's a narrator. Some there. Sometimes it's an unreliable narrator, first person, or mm-hmm. and other times you're really a fly on the wall, just trying to understand the story and picture what's going on by the clues that are given as they unfold. So it's a great project. Glenn and I have done this. Uh, we've made at least forty, forty-five, maybe fifty uh, tales. They're all completely unique. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a, and you put out the compilations. Well, we put every... them out as physical media because right. we also love the graphics, sure. and the, the posters, and we've had great collaborators do that. Uh, but they're all on uh, iTunes and mm-hmm. Amazon and through our website, TalesFromBeyondThePale.com. Uh, so that's a great project and. What's the the one that's coming up in August? Yeah, that's, there's uh, See Us Live at Lincoln Center. Uh, Lincoln Center has they oh it's part of a fe- the, they're, they're doing, doing a little a bit horror of, a, festival, of a horror festival, which is you know I think it's quite ballsy to do a horror festival in August in New York City <laughs> at Lincoln Center. So we'll see. Uh, but we uh, our show is on the twenty second of August, which is uh, I think it's a Wednesday at seven thirty p.m. Um, but surely it's uh, any kind of horror fan should check out the movies that are playing because there's some new uh, genre films that are screening, and I think it'll be a really great 
time. If you are stuck in New York, what could be better than to mm -hmm. sort of lose yourself in a festival where you kind of show up day right. after yeah. day and take in the the fair? And uh, this is going to be like one of the. Is this the last event in the in the festival or something? I'm not I sure. I don't know. I don't I, know. I, for some reason, I remember that, but I could be wrong. It could. But be. this is going to be. Are you going to record two plays? Yep, although we have some other special treats um, mm -hmm. that we'll be doing that night that reference uh, some releases coming up in the fall. Um, Tales has sort of um, moved to uh, vinyl. We've been enjoying uh, vinyl mm -hmm. releases. We did a vinyl release a couple, uh, well, I guess years ago now, mm -hmm. but it was just fantastic to drop the needle on a, on an old story, uh, a spooky tale. It reminds me of when I was little, I would listen to this uh, Alfred Hitchcock storybook mm -hmm. uh, on vinyl. And, uh, and well, I was, you know, listened to a lot of stuff on, on records. So we have some releases coming up. I guess I won't be specific, but let's mm -hmm. just say keep an eye out. There's some real or an treats ear or an case. ear out. Thank you, Adam. That's very much in the spirit of tales. Uh, so just very excited about that. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has a record player, but um, those who do will be quite tickled. You might be like me, where you do have a record player, but there's nothing to hook it up to at the moment. There's that problem, that, too. To, but I'm, I'm not, well, not going let to let it go. I'm going to be holding on to that record player. Yeah, and you know, usually we do a digital release along with this stuff, or sure, sure. in some cases, these vinyls are reissues of tales that have already been told, but just in a lovely package with great sonoral qualities. Um, so you, you record these, though. We did talk about this on a prior episode to some degree, but you record these throughout the year, correct? It, well, uh, uh, some of them are live. Um, okay. The live ones, which like Lincoln Center, uh, we record and then we spruce them up sure. in post production and we put them out. And you really feel the Adding energy. Those audio uh, gasps from the audience. Yes, from the, exactly. the gasps the, rather from the, the audience. The people fainting. Yes. The um, ambulance, faint sound of the ambulance, ambulance is approaching is the uh, theater. Yeah, we tighten up the emergency crews. We usually <laughs> yeah. cut them out. But uh, we've also had fantastic um, um, luck. Shoe. Uh, uh, recording in in the studio and just making completely standalone and of course you can get a little more complex although we like mm -hmm. to challenge ourselves the live ones can be equally ambitious but in concept you have more control if you're in the studio you can do more than one take for example um so they've been ping-ponging back and forth but we often are invited to uh um, film festivals or other weird events where we put this on as a it's novelty. A big, it sounds like a, though it's a big production for a film festival. In some, unless it's you know, yeah, it's. I mean, we've traveled all the way across the country with our little, you know, our foley box, which mm -hmm. is like a box with rocks in it, and yeah. you know, the pumpkins, sure, and, the clip clops, uh, the, the clip clops of, of the, the horses, of the encroaching the, horses, yeah. the cavalry, as right. it were. Yeah. Um, and on it goes. So mm -hmm. it's a bit of an enterprise. And, of course, none of this pays out quite the way you'd like. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we're we're thinking of moving it to a podcast where we uh, get to, um, I guess you give it away, but then maybe you have some business model where it, it makes sense. And, and in a way, we'd like it to be more available. It's mm -hmm. a bit rarefied. To find these tales, it's not hard, and they're not expensive, but you have to make yeah, some well, effort. And God knows there's no time for effort in this it. culture. No, no, there is not. <laughs> but Rick, they, Rick, don't. You must help me, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would if I gave you a thought. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I could never do Bogart. I no? only do Cagney. Really? No, that was uh, Laurie. Well, the first guy oh. was. Oh, oh, oh was. Rick, help oh, that's me. Peter that's Laurie. Laurie but yeah. then oh. didn't you do a little bogey at the end? I there? did bogey. I yeah, thought then you said Cagney. Well, I can do Cagney. That's yeah. What I'm okay. <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> you just you know you dirty rat. Don't <laughs> no, get me started with that. He never said that. Guy, no, did. right. Of course. None of the none Judy, of the lines. Judy, Judy, he never Judy, said that either, right? Yeah. Cagney never said Judy. Judy. Cagney never said Judy. <laughs> Judy. Well, I can do. I can do. I, I love the arsenic only just because I can do pretty much almost all the actors in it. You know, oh, so I have a good. lot of joy. So it's like Elaine, I'm not a Brewster, Elaine. You know, oh, he was, I'm not good. a Brewster. I remember that. He said I looked like Boris Karloff. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Johnny. Remember Peter Laurie and, uh, and Arsenic and Oil? Of course. No, oh, Johnny. No, oh, Johnny. Come down, Johnny. It's okay. Well, speaking Please of uh, vinyl, of course, I listened to that on uh, Ooh, Arsenic on when I was Arsenic little... Sure. There's a vinyl version of it? Oh, it's fantastic. And the irony is Karloff it. played it. Which right. he wasn't available for the movie, so it's I don't know Raymond thought, Massey or something. Oh right, it was Raymond Massey. It's rather that's disappointing right, did, because the no, whole gag Carlo is that it looks is, like Carlo. That's right. It's self-referential. It's meta. It's but the whole self-referential. Thing is, <laughs> do you remember when we were doing that? <laughs> you, Why you are we were, interviewing? We could be putting on arsenic <laughs> and old lace. <laughs> that's right. Right. <laughs> the. Um, that's right. And in fact, uh, I think that Karloff did the Broadway play. Well, that's, that's what that's, this, that's this is a what recording. the vinyl was. This is, it was a course. recording of the play, probably edited. They probably did that pretty frequently back then as a way to promote now the play. Now that you mention it, I need to purchase this immediately off of Amazon Prime, <laughs> <laughs> which is taking over the world. I wonder if that and recording, do you think that dropped. recording is available? Oh, well, I listened of, to it as a child. No, so I know that, but, I, it's but it's had a print, you know. It's probably, But you may be able to get copies. I don't know. Who knows? We'll have to look into God that. invented eBay. Yeah, but I just would love to hear that. Yes. Was Peter Lorre in the bro- original I Broadway don't play? So. Do you think? I'm not sure that I'm he sure was. he wasn't. No. That guy has an interesting story. Peter Lorre. I love him. He was you part know, of that he, whole, uh, you know, group the of German, uh, expats uh, or uh, you know, immigrants that well, yeah, the l- first ran. movie he did with Hitchcock... Uh, the Man Who Knew uh, Too Much, the first version. Oh, was that the first one he did? Yeah, when he auditioned, he met Hitchcock. And uh, he, you know, Hitch is a great prankster and joke teller. And, and Peter Lorre was, <laughs> yeah. he just loved Hitch. And they had a great laugh. And later on, he revealed that he didn't speak a word of English and that he was faking it. <laughs> <laughs> but he's very striking in that movie. And that uh, started his career in America. Right. Uh, or, uh, I yeah. guess that was England, so don't ask me. Oh wait, the first thirty it was did you say the thirty nine steps? Did I? That was wrong. I, no, I no, meant no, the man may, who knew too much. The man who knew too much. Yeah. You may have said that. I no, because I remember they remade Yeah, they made it years later with uh, Jimmy Stewart. Right. And of course Doris yeah. Day, who has a fantastic song. K Sarah Sarah. Right, written um, by Sly Stone. I remember it. <laughs> it's easy to say that the remake isn't as good, but in fact there are pleasures to it. Sure. What it is is the villain isn't as good. In fact I can't even remember him. And as Hitch will tell you, that uh, the villain is a good villain is the key to a good thriller. Yeah, but he remade it uh, an, an, an American version. Just think about the Joker. Mixed complete. Hmm? Is that, oh, he, he remade it for some reason. It's a, 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 maybe he just thought he could do a better job of it, or he wanted to make an American version. Uh, All of the Because he above. didn't think the British would, would connect with Americans, I don't he know. He always said, the first one was made by an enthusiastic amateur, and the second one was made by a professional. That's his take. Which, there you go. Then he went back to England for a little bit, didn't he? Didn't no, he? only to make Frenzy. Frenzy. Which oh, that was, was the only one he did in, uh, when he went back? Well, in the later okay. years, he that... went back and made Frenzy almost literally in his childhood uh, neighborhood. His father was oh. a green grocer in that. Right. Movie features a demented green grocer. And uh, I always. It was the first movie I bought when, uh, you know, video came out. Mm-hmm. So I have a great fondness for it. Uh, I also think it was a important. Um, it was Hitchcock getting his mojo back. He'd made like Topaz and Torn Curtain. He was really was getting a bit stodgy. Yeah. I can't even watch Topaz. It's, Torn Curtain yeah. has pleasures, but uh-huh. yikes. So he was really getting old and, um, and Marnie. stuffy. Well, Marnie is perverse and therefore, yeah. and has some classic stuff, mm-hmm. and it has James Bond. Um, That's right, of course. I but know. Um, Money Penny. It's it has Money Penny. Yes, Money Penny. <laughs> yeah. um, but Marnie Penny. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, nurse. <laughs> so, uh, but Frenzy, he really got his mojo back, and it's a yeah. vicious movie and wonderful. It I really think. is. If you watch it, it's starling <laughs> how <nasty>. misogynistic <laughs> it is. It, I wouldn't even say. Well, I, I don't think. I, it's funny about the idea of misogyny because he hates the men, too. The men are actually unpleasant. Yeah, uh, yeah. In other I words, I think it's point. more uh, that's so, uh, that's, man, uh, human hate. What do you call it? You know, misogynist. Uh, no. Or no, uh, misanthropic. Misanthropic. There you go. I'm like um, a thesaurus. And honestly, it was... Um, his last great film, which is to say his second to last film at all. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're not going to. Family Plot. plot. Yes. Mm, so be it. That's, and and uh, Family Plot was the only Hitchcock movie I can claim to have seen in 
you know, first run in a oh, movie theater. Nice. I was very young. I did too. Did uh, you? Yeah. But it's, it was was it the first one you saw in a movie theater? Uh, Hitch movie. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, mean, what I mean, I don't know that's because what I mean. they had old. Uh, they had no, no, but first run. For no, oh, yeah, like first I didn't run. see Frenzy in the theater yeah, right, at all. Of course. But that was the second to last film? Frenzy was. Oh, okay. Then, of course, you're right. I mean, the fans will correct me, no doubt, but I think that's <laughs> the case. Yes, in chronological order. It, uh, in chronological order. order. Um, but I am a Hitch fan. Everybody knows that. And uh, I remember the first Hitchcock movie I saw was Suspicion, and I didn't know what I was seeing. Right. I just remember... In those days, I really only responded to the actors, and I liked Cary Grant, and I thought that movie had a strange quality and was sort of riveting, and of course, now I can identify it as Hitch's fantastic uh, suspense touch, and um, it was fun to really remember what an impression uh, that movie made on me, mm -hmm. and, in, and Hitchcock himself. And then, you know, whatever, yeah. I don't know what I saw after that. Do or when I even identified that it was the director. Do you um, kind of, have you uh, found that was the the point of demarcation for you in a way, uh, finding Hitchcock, that it, that when, uh, that kind of made a big impact? Uh, well, you already admitted it, it did. But yeah. do you think that was kind of what led you down this Primrose Path. No. No, <laughs> it's, it's uh, very simple. I can say it in a okay. couple sentences. I just loved monster movies. Mm -hmm. And in the old days, you'd have several times a day, several different channels, all with its own personality. Yeah, you could probably... watch uh, scary movies, for example, yeah. at 11 or 12. On a Saturday, there'd be a chiller, chiller theater. theater. The Six and... Fingers coming up yeah, from exactly. the ground. Chiller. It is on YouTube. Those of you who are multitasking. Um, look up the Chiller logo. It's very charming. And then that was followed by a, usually a black and white movie mm -hmm. from Universal or RKO. Yeah. Vincent and Price. Those, no, those were, were those later. Those were the color those, movies. Okay. You might find those more likely at 4.30, at the 4.30 movie. <laughs> okay. And they'd also, 4.30 movie also had Godzilla and mm -hmm. those kind of, so those were yeah. color movies. And that was, I think, Channel 9, and it had a different uh, yeah, archive yeah, yeah. than Channel sure, 5 sure. and Channel 11. But Universal was, uh, what we said, uh, Boris Karloff movies? Yeah, those were yeah. the Boris Karloff movies, those, uh, Bela Lugosi, Bella Lugosi, The Wolfman, uh, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, and then weirder movies like The Crawling Hand, I mean, The Crawl the creeping eye <laughs> the uh, and them you mm -hmm. know about giant ants and and tarantula mm -hmm. and uh, the incredible shrinking man and all these spectacularly evocative black and white movies so that uh, captivated me and then then you'd read monster magazines and you'd have an awareness of even earlier films that you weren't necessarily seeing like mm -hmm. uh, Lon Chaney mm -hmm. the man of a thousand faces and then one day I saw the movie Man of a Thousand Faces starring James Cagney. And that sent me into a whole other direction, being intrigued by Cagney and the Warner Brothers social realism gangster films. And mm -hmm. then you met Bogart and then you met uh, Edward G. Uh, Robinson. And, um, yeah, they were both. And George Raft. George Raft, and, that's what yeah, I was yeah. Scarface, the original mm -hmm. Scarface. Say hello to my little friend. <laughs> So anyway, that was my journey. Uh, very much old movies. I, I liked comedies. I liked Fred Astaire. Mm -hmm. So all of that mm -hmm. black and white world was driven by love of the performer. Um, and of course, unknowingly, I was loving the directing, all these sure. uh, whoever, right. you know, James Whale made the Frankenstein movies, the first two. But, um, but we're also lucky in the sense, if you want to call it luck, <laughs> just to, was the way it was. The way that it we, was. They yes. didn't have a a children's movie industry at the time. Yes, That's occasionally, right. once a year, maybe twice, you'd get a bed knobs and broomsticks. You'd get a That's Disney right. movie. Right. But we essentially, because we're in the same age, I think, yeah. roughly, we would see the movies that were available. We had them on television, as you're describing. That's I mean, I grew right. up with the same one. But, you know, we would, if we wanted to go to the theaters, we saw what was available and so we right. ended up going to kind of like mature movies i, I mean we had pink panther movies yes right which was and james bond and we had sure. uh, which were a little risque for for, right. for like very teens, exciting but, and the hot yeah. rock and movies right. like that and you had sure. once again the entree for me always was the actors yeah well sure um, 
and I don't know when I, I mean, became Hitchcock aware was of the probably Hitchcock. I'm going to guess. I mean, in a way, Hitchcock was the he, first director you yeah. become aware of. You know? the, yeah, I mean, we're in, talking in the states because he was a, he was because at the British well, he was movies, also on TV. Right. Oh, right. And right, he was a host, he was a so he was a personality of his, yeah. in his own right. Now, I also grew up on, you know, for whatever reason, Hitchcock would present ghost stories in books. Those were the days when you read books when you were little, and so you'd yeah. have these volumes in which there'd be his face and some wry introductory paragraph that just seemed very fun. Mm -hmm. And and then, as I say, uh, I listened to Hitchcock on vinyl, also mm -hmm. presenting short stories. So he really um, captivated. And I think you became aware that he was the director. You were aware of a movie like Psycho existed. And then, um, you know, the other thing that I love thinking about, and, you know, every now and again I got nostalgic, I get nostalgic and look at the Internet, and, you know, they were also marketing monstrous to children now. Mm -hmm. um, everything from Count Chocula cereal, but also the monster models um, that you could make, and those were from the Universal Canon. So, and then the magazines, the horror magazines, and then some of them were more risque when they sort of went off uh, creepy and eerie, had a tinge of sort of 60s trippiness as well. Mm -hmm. And all the while, Mad Magazine, these things were also subverting authority. Mm -hmm. So it was a very exciting time. And I feel like what's happened is that uh, even though there's a lot of awareness in the culture the kids aren't really there's a different relationship to authority and they've completely bought into things like Amazon and Facebook and Twitter and they don't really recognize that those are corporate entities mm -hmm. into which they're given literally all their data all their lives and their dependency so you we had a lot more freedom in the 70s you know you could say oh well you've given yourself over to mad magazine but that's not true you'd throw it away if you didn't like it and um mm -hmm. so you know there was a counterculture that was built into the mainstream culture and that was an exciting time and that's what the 70s movies that everybody romanticizes mm -hmm. they also were dealing with the individual's relationship to authority and then the anti-hero was created uh Taxi Driver, The uh, Dog Day Afternoon, these kind of movies had that urgency. They were really questioning society. And so just just to wrap it up, that's my orientation. Um, and, uh, and now the kids know how much money every movie makes that comes out. And everything is monetized. The value of a film is like, well, Get Out was the fastest, you know, that movie. You know, you may like it for other reasons, but you're very, very aware... Right. Um, success is is gauged, yeah, by not by office. what's hip or right, what's right. cool or what's different or yeah, what's a discovery. It, well, I think it I exists, mean, but it's in a much larger. It's a, up against a much larger, right? You know, uh, uh, gauge. Which and is, even horror was mm -hmm. something that you. It was off the beaten track. It was a little bit uh, rancid and uh, and scary. Mm -hmm. And I remember for all this nostalgia. Um, Another seminal moment was seeing Night of the Living Dead on television, and it looked like it was black and white, and it looked like the old movies that I watched, but there was something unsettling about it. It was relentlessly bleak mm -hmm. and didn't have a happy ending and was really claustrophobic, and the monsters were unrelenting, and th the nice people got killed as quickly as the bad people, and this was a great revelation, mm -hmm. and I felt mm -hmm. like that was my... Uh, Popping my cherry on like a new kind of yeah. uh, bleak n nihilistic reality, and of course I've loved that movie ever since. Chainsaw had that same effect. These movies were bleak. This yeah. was a different kind of horror. Well, what? Right. Not for kids, you know. Not to be made into a cereal box. <laughs> They've <laughs> what, tried. What is the uh, with Freddy and all that shit? 